Hello, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Data Cooperatives in the Real World, Progress and Challenges. I'd like to welcome Anouk to the stage to begin our session. Hello, welcome all. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, like I said, my name is Anouk Ruhak. I'm a fellow with Mozilla working on data governance, um, which is partly what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and I am joined by Katrina Liget and Kobi Nissim. Uh, Katrina is a computer, uh, works for the computer science department at the Hebrew University, uh, where she is the head of the program on internet and society. And her research interests include using mathematics to model and understand social concerns in data. Uh, well, Kobi uh, works for the computer science department at the Georgetown University. Um, where he works on cryptography and privacy and spends a lot of his time trying to develop paradigms for protecting the privacy of individual information. Um, he's also one of the inventors of differential privacy. So clearly we have a lot of expertise in the room here today. Um, and what we'll be doing is uh, Kobe and Katrina will um, tell you a bit about their research in a 30 minute talk and afterwards we'll dive into a discussion and also open up the floor for questions. So with all of that out of the way, uh, Katrina, Kobe, take it away. Thank you. Okay, hello. Um, I'm Kobe Nissim and uh, I'm from Georgia University and Katrina Liggett from the Hebrew University will co-present with me in this session. Would first like to thank the organizers of Radical Exchange and specifically to Matt Pruitt for inviting us to this session. And I'd like to thank Anouk for her really kind introduction and for leading this session. Um, so Katrina and I are theoretical computer scientists with background in cryptography, in differential privacy and game theory. And we've been developing algorithmic tools for addressing issues of privacy and fairness in computation. Uh, in the last few years, we started thinking about the data ecosystem and this is what we'll also focus on today. And we're thinking about its strength, but also its weaknesses and the po potential exploits of data. And then, uh, that is, uh, we focus our attention of how individual data is being collected, how it's stored, and how it is used by internet companies and also by governments in some cases, and on the many vulnerabilities and potential exploits that this mode of data use uh, creates. We're now working towards developing tools that can help improve the data ecosystem. And we realize that these should be more than just technological tools, which are our home base. After all, we cannot expect to solve societal problems merely using technology. And hence we look into combining tools coming from different disciplines, in particular, including policy and economics with technology. And this is a huge problem that is beyond the scope of just one research team like ours. So we're assembling, uh, and we've been working in the last couple of years on assembling a group of researchers uh, that would work on these issues that share interests here under the title Data Corps. And we'd like to tell you a bit about this project. So we live in a world in which companies have learned how to draw amazing insights and offer incredible new services and technologies on the basis of rich stores of personal information. To facilitate this, rich profiles of each of us are continuously being assembled and updated. And I think of this as each of us goes through our day with a cloud of data floating above our heads. And that data includes not only our browsing behavior and our shopping habits, but also rich information about our social relationships, our health, our sexual preferences, finances, mental health, religious beliefs, political orientation, you name it. And these profiles are effectively under the control of just a handful of entities, and they lend these entities enormous power. But nobody elected the internet platforms to these roles of power, and the platforms and their leadership certainly don't reflect the full diversity of humanity, nor do they necessarily have our best interests at heart. Meanwhile, the fact that our data is siloed away in the hands of just a few means that we're unable to unlock its full potential to benefit society. 
Think of a creative new health startup that needs access to data to thrive, or a small country that wishes to use data to improve the lives of its citizens. Often they can't get their hands on the data that they need. And although we habitually talk about personal data, the reality is that your data poses risks not just to you and to those close to you, but also to people you've never even met and to society as a whole. So a useful metaphor for us to help us think about informational harms is to distinguish between harms that originate in information coming from me, what we call the outgoing edge, and those risks that originate from information and services that are provided to me, that is tailored to my profile. We call that the incoming edge. So we all know about the risks associated with personal data getting into the wrong hands, be it embarrassment or increased insurance premiums, loss of access to services or rights or mobility, rejection of a job application or losing a job, blackmail, coercion, arrest, bodily harm. But the harms, of course, affect not only the person directly involved, but also there are toxic effects that stem from living in a society in which these risks hang over us and our fellow citizens. And it's worth observing as well that we see the potential for amplified harms to those who are already in disadvantaged groups. So these platforms with their data power are growing into extremely sophisticated tools for shaping our thoughts, our interests, our desires, and our actions. They influence how we spend our money, whom we date and marry, what we read, and even our perceptions of reality. And they have incredibly refined ability to provide us with dif differentiated information, opportunities, experiences, prices, services, based on our personal profiles. But another word for differentiation is discrimination. And there's a huge opportunity here also for manipulation. Now, a common reaction of technologists to these risks is to focus on technologies that help each of us lock our data down. But it's important to bear in mind that you can't protect yourself and those close to you from these risks just by withholding your data. Even if you lock your data down, inferences will still be drawn about you on the basis of others' data, replicating all of these data harms. And of course, surveillance and manipulation are not just harms faced by individuals, but severe threats to democratic institutions and to other aspects of a society that we hold dear. So the status quo of how our data is used and how we receive services is the result of long evolution. Uh, with the intermediate decisions mostly guided by mundane business and commercial interests, which are often not aligned with other uh, so societal concern. We believe and hope that the current reality is not a necessity and that now is the right time for rethinking major parts of the data ecosystem to better align it with our societal needs. So we think about data co-ops, and that's the name that we chose for this project, as a layer in uh, the user platform interaction. And this layer is going to be involved in various things, including gathering users, computing over personal information with privacy and security in order to deal with what Katrina called the outgoing edge, negotiating, overseeing, and enforcing the terms of outsiders' use of the data. And this also includes the inc incoming edge and redistributing value back to the co-op members. And we don't think about this as necessarily as one uh, kind of a solution or one kind of uh, uh, a, an intervention or even a single intervention uh, suit of interventions, it could be that there would be a multiplicity of data co-ops, each with uh, different characteristics, and that jointly they will hopefully uh, achieve some of our societal goals. Now, the ideas of the idea of having uh, such an entity is not new and uh, Hegel and Singer have written about intermediaries in the late 90s. Let me read a, read a few quotes from uh, this uh, book. They said, as consumers begin to challenge marketeers for control of their own customer information, they'll find themselves in need of a trusted third party to act as the custodian agent and broker of that information on their behalf, while at the same time protecting consumer privacy. 
This third party will act as a kind of personal agent, information intermediary or intermediary, helping consumers both protect and enrich themselves by capturing their own consumer information and then selling it to the many companies that are now getting that information for free. While our vision is not uh, identically aligned with the vision in this book, there are a lot of commonalities. Now, uh, we've seen intermediaries uh, in the recent past, and actually there have been uh, probably three waves. Uh, the first wave is from the late 90s and early 2000s. And uh, this was probably cut by the dot-com crash of the early 2000s. And there's a very interesting thesis by Bethany Likely that lists reasons for the failure of this first wave and a lot of lessons there. And she focuses mostly on economic concerns. There's been a second wave and that was probably strangled by technology that was not mature enough to achieve its goal. And there is a paper that you can see here below by Narayana, Narayana et al. that analyzes these failures and points to the technical challenges of distributed models, to problems with unraveling of inefficient intermediaries, and the many challenges of interoperability. And we're definitely seeing now a third wave, and some of it is being represented in this very uh, workshop. So what has changed since, um, since the, the previous wave? Um, the amount of information that is collected about us has grown significantly. So if that was the problem, this is how it looks now. And in particular, through our phones, we, uh, companies collect a lot of information. They have access to all kinds of information about us. And importantly, in the last decade, this massive collection has become visible and there is growing public awareness and worry about the misuse of this information, whether it is intended or inadvertent and the potential harms to individuals, to group and to our, our entire social political structure. At the same time, technologies have developed to the point that some of them are currently making big first tries to implementation and use. These include uh, secure multi-party computation, um, sorry, differential privacy, homomorphic encryption, deep learning, blockchain technology, federated learning. And also there has been a significant change and which is still happening in the legal um, landscape. And we now have in the EU, the GDPR and also change is happening in the US. An example is the California CCPA. So the question is whether we can put these pieces to work together so as to uh, solve or at least mitigate this uh, problem and whether we have all the pieces that we need to address these issues or we need to develop uh, some new pieces. And I'd like to uh, focus on one example, just to have an idea of how we can use some of these tools, the, techn uh, the, the uh, technology and the legal technology in order to address some issues in a real world uh, situation. So consider, for example, the setting uh, of personalized web services. So there is a system designed to provide personalized web services, such as um, news items, personalized new items that match your interest or uh, to suggest products uh, for you to purchase or to match you with a date and so on. And there are clear benefits to personalization in such systems. What you want to do here is also explore the pragmatic sides and then think how modern technology whether this is technology or legal technology can intervene to alleviate these problems. So information about us, this is the left hand of the picture is collected on our devices, in particular our phones. And this includes information about almost every aspect of our existence, including our location, our social contacts, our interests, the services we consume and much more. 
And this data is sent to the companies whose services we consume. You only see a small fraction of these here on this slide. And this information is analyzed using a variety of machine learning tools to produce what we call a recommendation algorithm. Recommendation algorithm is an algorithm that makes a personalized suggestion to an individual on the basis of their own characteristics. So this is what you see on the right here. To provide us with personalized, ser personalized service, our information is sent to the platform which runs the recommendation algorithm. The platform feeds the information into the recommendation algorithm to obtain a recommendation which is, it could be a product which is tailored to our own characteristics. It could be a news article, it could be a haircut product, it could be anything else. The recommendation is then sent back to our device. There are many points where uh, here where data can be exploited. Uh, in particular, we contribute detailed private information and the data of individuals is exposed to the company which collects it and performs the learning. The data of individuals is exposed to the company which executes the recommendation algorithm. The training data can be encoded in the recommendation algorithm. And machine learning algorithms are notorious for memorizing data that was used in the training phase, which just for training purposes, and then for exposing it when the learning product is put to use. And all this data may be exposed in other ways, for instance, hacking, whether by criminals or adversarial governments. It may come to be exposed to law enforcement agencies by court sub subpoena and so on. And furthermore, recommendation algorithms often reflect biases which existed in the training data. These have been shown to lead to subtle and not so subtle discrimination against minorities and disadvantaged groups, and even to amplify the bias. And finally, in, in this list of uh, exploits or potential exploits, recommendation algorithms can present each individual with a different worldview. News articles created specifically for me, access to job opportunities created specifically for me, and so on. This can lead to political manipulation and social fragmentation. So we'd like to see and ask whether we can use these new technologies to intervene in this specific uh, process, in this type of process. So I'll only explore several possibilities now because uh, of time. And the first one is distribu the distribution of data and computation. The relevant technology here is secure multi-party computation. This is a technology that was born in theoretical work almost four decades ago. It made significant steps toward use in practice in the last 10 to 15 years. And in secure multi-party computation, we mean a cryptographic protocol. So I depicted it this way, where data and computation are distributed between multiple parties that jointly compute a desired outcome. And the magic is none of the parties learns any information about the data or even about intermediate results in the computation, still they can produce the outcome. In the setting of personalization, if the learning is performed with secure multi-party computation, then no single party holds detailed user profiles. Let me give another example uh, where we consider the protection of personal information. As I said, uh, there are many risks for this information in this uh, kind of systems. So another technology that, which is making important first steps in the real world is differential privacy. And differential privacy protects individual information by making sure that the outcome of computations are insensitive to any individual's information. In a nutshell, the outcome of a differentially private computation should stay almost the same whether individual information is contributed to the computation or is not used. This is achieved by means of noise addition. And for example, in some differentially private computations, the individual, uh, individuals add noise into the data that they contribute to the computation. Still, the computation can do a lot of useful stuff. In other applications, the noise is added in steps of the computations or just before it is, uh, the output is computed and released, like here. 
And this provides individuals with strong guarantees of privacy in cases the noise addition is not too disruptive for the computation. And many learning problems have been shown at least theoretically to be such that you can apply them with differential privacy. And finally, I want to mention that we can also uh, use legal protection. And there's a, a growing toolkit of legal controls that can be put in place to regulate which information can be collected from individuals and how it is collected to regulate the types of users that this information may be subjected to and also to regulate who can access, get access to this information or to products of this information. In specific cases, these controls can be written in machine readable code and become part of systems which log and audit the information use. These controls can work in synergy with technical controls such as those presented in the previous slide, secure multi-party computation and differential privacy our this creating this synergy and making sure that it works well is not easy, far from that. In many cases, legal controls leave a lot of gray areas and loopholes. And furthermore, it is hard to analyze the combination, the combined effect of legal and technical measures. So as, as Kofi highlighted, we have this impressive, relatively new suite of legal and technical tools. Um, but it's important to observe that they don't solve all the problems with the data ecosystem. One example of an under-addressed issue here is that none of the technologies we've just surveyed really manages to put any restriction on what I was referring to as the incoming edge. So in particular, none of the tech tools that we've mentioned so far are really in a position to intervene to protect us from discrimination or manipulation. And legal tools, even if they try to forbid discrimination, are not really in a very good position to truly prevent it because data-driven discrimination is often much more subtle than they're able to recognize. So even a fully decentralized GDPR compliant blockchain-based consent-driven federated deep learning algorithm that uses differential privacy to protect the privacy of its training data and fully homomorphic encryption to protect its users could still learn to offer lower paying jobs to women than to men. So now the question is, what's next? So in particular, we now have the exciting challenge of trying to fill in the holes and of bridging between the existing legal tools and technical tools to ensure that they complement and support one another and of bringing these various pieces of a future data co-op really into being. And this, this work of focusing on data co-op surfaces really a great number of interesting and important research questions. And there's plenty of work to do still on technical theoretical foundations, such as building new techniques to carry out crucial computations in a distributed and privacy preserving fashion. And there's interesting work to be done in designing technically how all the pieces will fit together. Co-ops also of course raise numerous interesting questions in the realm of governance, including issues about how co-ops interactions with other entities might be governed and the internal governance structure of a co-op. And given the enormous value of data, it's, it's not surprising that co-ops also raise economic questions, including um, setting proper incentives for participants in the new data ecosystem and new techniques for understanding the value of data, how we should reason about it. And really, I think some of the most exciting challenges are really at that bridging point between disciplines, building components that work together and that can achieve their goals in the real world. Now, part of why we feel that co-ops need attention from academia is because this brand new entity introduces serious new risks and folks who are more oriented towards implementation might not have the inclination or the luxury to deeply and constantly dig into these risks. But it's really crucial, we think, to be alert to the unintended consequences that any revision to the data ecosystem could have. And in the case of data co-ops, um, the co-ops could potentially be subject to existing threats, such as hacking or subpoena, um, and also without sufficient controls put in place, both technical and legal, 
co-ops could eventually serve to replicate existing data harms, the whole list that we started with at the beginning of the talk. And also we, we have to keep an eye on how co-ops could turn bad over time and even how they might cause new harms, such as, for example, amplifying existing disparities in society. Um, but despite all of these risks, um, we think this is a direction in which we must proceed. And the time is really ripe here for a rethinking of the data ecosystem. And we're at a threshold of technical feasibility for many of the necessary components. And so we really hope that progress in this direction will help lead us to a hopeful new data future. Great. Thank you so much. That was an absolutely fantastic talk. Um, I'm sure everyone learned a lot. You managed to get such a wide range of different, uh, I want to say topics, but more disciplines together and um, actually make sense of them. That's incredibly impressive. So thank you. Um, I wanted to start off with a question that came up for me, which is uh, you described the shortcomings of the legal tools and some of the technical tools, especially when it comes to the incoming edge. Um, and I was wondering, what is the role of governments there? Could we just look at our governments to say, legislate against, you specifically mentioned the example of discrimination of the job market. Wouldn't that be something for a government maybe to, to step in and legislate against? So maybe I'll take it and then Katrina can uh, continue. So I think the tools, the legal tools that we have currently uh, have their own limitations and uh, especially when they try to deal with technology. Uh, law is, has not been uh, well adjusted to deal with technology in many, many cases. And trying to uh, just regulate um, the fact that the technology should not discriminate, should not create biases, should not amplify biases and so on, all the exploits, uh, potential exploits that we mentioned uh, is, is really hard. It's very hard to define these risks in a way that we can translate and work into uh, technological measures. So a lot of the work that needs to be done is really in creating this synergy between technology and, and the law and technology and government. And in understanding how our societal expectations that are expressed in our legal system and the way we think about uh, the world, how we can translate them into technical and other controls that we can implement in, in, in our information systems. Um, yeah. I would, I would maybe just add a couple of, of thoughts in this direction. Um, one of them is, is that it, I think it's, it's very powerful to be able to technically uh, provably prevent a certain uh, occurrence, uh, to, to prevent a certain uh, bad outcome, to provably protect, to provably separate, um, to sort of have almost these sort of physical boundaries and barriers and guarantees that you can put in place. And I think those are an, a complement to, to the legal, um, which I think, I think of as less of a physical boundary, even though maybe that's not quite the right analogy. Um, but I think you need both. And as Kobe said, it's really important that the legal tools and interventions are aware of the capabilities and limitations and risks of the technologies, um, that there really needs to be this, this uh, sort of nested interwoven um, set of legal tools and technical tools that, that work together in this space. Let me just mm -hmm. add, sorry, add one thing about the word that uh, continue, uh, Katrina mentioned, she said provably, and we're really trying to, uh, we're coming from uh, a field that tries to put a lot of stuff in a mathematical framework and analyze it mathematically and prove guarantees based on this mathematical analysis. And I think there is a specific need for this um, to, to be able to prove and, and argue uh, uh, rigorously about the systems because of scale. 
the judicial system uh, cannot deal with the scale that uh, of problems that um, uh, uh, digital systems can create. Digital systems are going to make an enormous number of decisions every second, every minute, every day. And if we have disputes about these or, or concerns about these decisions, we cannot just bring them to court and, and discuss them one by one. This is why it's very uh, important that with our technical solutions, we'll have a much higher level of guarantee that we're used to in using, in, in having a similar system in our daily life. Right, I think, yeah, I, I really see your point of uh, kind of the law and uh, these different governance systems like co-ops as well as technology working together. Um, because as you're explaining this, I'm thinking if you don't have the law to say this isn't allowed, um, uh, even a co-op would have a hard time, maybe I'm wrong here, but I think even a co-op would have a hard time uh, mandating it, right? Like you do need those two things to work together. Um, which is maybe a good time to ask a question that was asked by someone in the audience, uh, Sam. Sam says, please describe the form and technology of your proposed co-op structure. Um, and I think for me specifically, I think the form would be really interesting to find out a bit more about. Sure, I, I guess I can say that it's, it's somewhat intentional that we didn't just lay out a full uh, engineering architecture for you here. Um, it's because there are still a bunch of question marks and, and important issues to be resolved. And also in part because um, it's not clear to us that there is one true co-op, one right answer in, in many of the, the aspects of the technical design. Um, so at this point, um, where we're coming from, from a tech technical perspective is sort of simultaneously top down and bottom up. So from the top down perspective, we're doing work along the lines of identifying fundamental principles and guarantees that we want to get from the co-op. And from the bottom up side, we're designing technical components that could help form part of a system that would give these guarantees. Um, but there's still work to be done to meet in the middle. And the important part of the work that we're doing is uh, a bridging work. We look at uh, concepts that appear both in uh, say in the legal literature and the technical literature. And we're trying to understand the relationships between these concepts. After all, I present differential privacy, but you could think that uh, differential privacy, the word privacy is like, I just, just chose it arbitrarily. Does it really reflect privacy in the way we mean to have privacy in the real world? And this is why we need to go to the philosophical and the legal writing about privacy and actually try to do the hard work to match between the two and to see that we have a convincing argument that technology satisfies these requirements or these expectations that the legal and philosophical framework uh, puts. And by the way, this also fits back into legal, into the legal and philosophical framework because the technological understanding allows us to understand uh, what is feasible, what is doable, and what is not. And then when we look at the less mathematical literature, we see expectations that, um, uh, that are in some cases unrealistic. We know, we know how to prove mathematically that they are not achievable. And we'd like to take this mathematical understanding and fit it back into the legal and philosophical thinking about, about privacy and ask, then what? If this is impossible to do, what would you like us to do? Yeah, no, I think that's incredibly important work. Um, as I think both data protection laws have created some kind of technical difficulties and sometimes create more problems than they solve, although they also do solve a lot of problems. Um, I want to add another discipline, uh, economics. You mentioned at the beginning of your talk um, that data has a lot of value and it can be very valuable to the public. And I'm kind of wondering how, how does that, how does the co-op either capture the value or redistribute the value? Like how does, how do the economics of this work? Great, so maybe I'll, I can, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Maybe I'll start with technical answer and, and Katrina who has a leg in economics also will, will complement that with uh, the economic answer. 
so on, on the technical part, I think we will focus on uh, products, on, on the generation of products, data products, uh, for which we can, uh, th that have value, um, hopefully economic value, and for which we have technical solutions so that we can produce these products in a way that is privacy preserving, that is fair, hopefully, and so on. And these will be products that the data co-op will be able to offer to interested parties um, in, in, and hence create value for the co-op members. So I'll maybe just add a, a bit to that and expand. Um, so, so one important point is that um, in many formal mathematical senses, um, where the value is really being created in data is the point where many different data sources are coming together. So many different types of data, and many different people's data. And so one of the things that's going on here in the co-op is it's shifting that point where the data comes together out of the realm of the platforms and into the realm and into a realm that's controlled more by the individuals. Um, and so that's a, that is changing the sort of structure of the power and the, the value in this space. Um, an important thing to note though, is that the co-op is potentially bringing together much more data, much more varied data and opening it up to many, many more uses and users than the current ecosystem. Of course, all of that governed by the protecting the interests of the individuals and their rights, but potentially this is an enormous source of new value in our data, this opening it up and um, new combinations and new possibilities and new data products. The co-op is also in a position to do more to protect the value of the data, um, meaning um, to keep the data valuable by keeping it safe by keeping it private when necessary, by protecting the sort of statistical properties of the data that, um, that are sometimes at risk when data isn't being, um, isn't being maintained carefully. Um, and, and so we have the potential for the, the co-op really to be introducing new value into the system and not just sort of redistributing the, the existing value that's there. Really like this, uh, your point of the data being all the data, for different sources of data coming together in the co-op rather than in the company. I think it also like uh, it's an easier thing to imagine as well. Um, and you mentioned value as what well, I suspect more of a public good, like we can do a lot of good things with our data, but is there also a notion of value um, in, in more monetary sense? Do you see a co-op uh, like quite literally redistributing uh, monetary value as well? Or are we really talking about value in terms of better health outcomes, better uh, climate outcomes, stuff like that? So I, I think there's, there's both a public good aspect and also a monetary aspect here. Um, a question here is um, where should that money, that sort of, that money value go? Um, so if a co-op is making a data resource available to a data user, um, should the user be directly compensating in, you know, in currency for that access to the data? And if so, um, should that money be finding its way back in some direct sense to the individuals who provided the data? Or should that be reinvested in um, achieving the goals of the co-op? And there's some, some trade-offs and tensions here. And, and one of the important considerations is that um, there's a risk involved in if a, the structure of a data co-op is relying in some sense on making money off of the data of its participants. Um, there's a risk that that creates incentives for the co-op that might be at odds with the best interests of those individuals. And so that's, that's an, a space of issues that we're still exploring, but I, I don't have a single clear answer there. Maybe Kobe wants to add. Yeah, let me add that. Uh, we believe that the co-op would be in a better position to uh, retain or protect the value in the data. Currently what is happening when, uh, when Google or Facebook or other companies 
uh, uh, take get data from my machine. I have very little control on, of how this data is being used, and um, and I also have very little negotiation power regarding the use of my data. Whereas we hope that if uh, a data corp will have will will gain a critical mass of participants, it will be in a much better position to negotiate terms for the data use to limit the, the use of the data. So uh, the companies and the organizations that will receive the data from the co-op will have clear limitations on what they can do with it. And they shouldn't do any more. And they, hopefully also the co-op will have means to audit some of this activity to make sure that indeed the limits are, uh, are um, respected. And that will allow the co-op to kind of resale the same data for different uses and, and obtain hopefully the optimal value in the data. Whereas with the way we're working currently, where at best individuals can uh, uh, negotiate the value for the, the data and I'm not claiming they can, but at best this is the situation, uh, the value that they, they, that they would get and the guarantees that they would get is much lower. Right. Um, we have less than 10 minutes left, so I'm going to ask a few more questions that are coming from the audience. Uh, we have Maria Savona asking uh, two different questions. Uh, the first one is, what is the difference between data co-ops, data trust, and data stewardship? Um, I know there's so many terms. Uh, and then her second question is, do you think that these intermediaries undermine individual agency over our data, uh, especially over our own data? So maybe I'll start with the second part of that. Um, data ownership is a, is a tricky and fraught concept. Um, so I hope we highlighted a bit in the talk, but I can highlight it some more here. It's, it's not so clear. It's, it's hard to imagine a piece of data that truly only pertains to me and truly only has consequences for me. Um, my data, be it medical or social or consumer, whatever it is, it has consequences for those around me, those who are close to me, those who are related to me, but it also has consequences for others in the sense that it can be used to draw inferences about other people, people I've never met. And so data ownership is, is a tricky thing. And now we certainly still have a, a serious uh, intention to protect individuals and rights of individuals and to consider rights of individuals, um, but I don't think we can just think about the individuals and, and, uh, and do something meaningful here. We really do need to think about the collective. There's absolutely tensions. There are absolutely intention, tensions here. The, there will be people with different interests, different preferences, different concerns participating in the co-op. There will be disagreements about the right um, ways to move forward. And this is um, part of the reason why there's such rich and interesting questions about internal governance for, for data cooperatives. Um, but I don't think it's um, just individuals losing to the collective. I think it's um, individuals and the collective hopefully both gaining, but also making some trade-offs along the way. Right. Um, Maybe with respect to the first question, I hope we've been vague enough to make sure that all these models would, could fall under a data co-op model. And more seriously, uh, one of the things well, that we've been doing like, in the last spring is to survey a list of more than 30 projects that we think are related to this data co-op uh, vision. And I, I, I guess now we'll see maybe double the number. And, um, and I believe that a lot of the products of our research will be, uh, will be also uh, applicable to some of these uh, some of these uh, projects. So whether you are interested in building a data trust or in solving a particular issue of how users uh, protect their information and negotiate it with others and so on, I believe parts of the technology and the understanding that will be developed in this project would apply uh, to that. Right. Um, yeah. I working in data governance, I get this question a lot. Um, there's some really good, like 
I always refer, there's a really good paper by the Apti Institute in India that basically explains all these, these different concepts and the dimensions that they live in. So highly recommend Googling that one and reading it. Um, sorry to give everyone homework, by the way. Uh, another question, I think this could be quite a short one um, from one of our anonymous audience members. Are there any synergies on cooperating with existing data union communities such as Streamer? So we'd love to build more relationships um, with, with existing projects. Um, some of them we've explored, that one in particular we haven't, um, but we welcome suggestions actually. Um, feel free to send us names, links, ideas of projects that we might want to interact with and collaborate with. Um, as Kobe mentioned, there are a lot of them out there and it would be helpful for you to help us in the filtering of trying to find those with the, the most productive potential synergies so that we can, we can explore them. So thank you in advance. Great. Great. And also, uh, we, a project that could uh, have synergy with our project, we're very interested in uh, exploring these potential collaborations. Great. Um, question from Matt. Do you think we need to involve larger numbers of people in the education, uh, adjudication of all these new decisions and judgment calls? I'm not sure that I understood the question. I'm, not, um, I'm also not completely sure. I'm guessing it's the governance decisions that we make about our data. Um, but Matt, if you want to clarify, maybe we can answer another question first. Um, Nikolaus asks, how do you see micropayments helping moving towards data co-ops, um, basically incentivizing people by paying them back? So I think, think the fact that we, we have all these uh, new technologies that are enabling us to move to sort of lightweight ways of moving money between people with all sorts of additional um, guarantees, certainly support the development of systems where value of, of various types is moving more fluidly. Um, so, so I think there's definitely a synergy there. Um, and then we have a last question, which is, does the work that is being done with self-sovereign identity, trust over IP with zero knowledge proofs and verifiable credentials um, help the data proof issue? Is a question from Walter. So my, my belief is yes. Uh, first, a lot of these com are, are components of uh, secure multi-party computation that I mentioned, in particular zero knowledge proof. Um, in cases where data will have to be um, certified, we will need to use technology that allows us to get uh, certificates and signatures and so on over there to make sure that we are using uh, correct and real data. I believe that all these components will um, fit into various solutions for various problems that we'll look at as we explore the technology for, for data probes. Great. Um, I think we ran out of questions from the audience. Uh, we still have a bit of time, so if you do want to ask a question, uh, please go ahead and do. A question by Matt, no? There was. Do we want to give that a try? Um, do you think we need to involve larger people, numbers of people in the edu I cannot pronounce this word, adjudication of all these new decisions and judgment calls? Um, we were a bit unclear what that meant, but if you if you want to give it a try, that I, I can give it a guess. <laughs> Great. Uh, so if, if 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 the question is about how to govern the internal decisions of such such a, a, a scheme of a data co-op, definitely my own belief is that there should be a way for the co-op members to jointly make decisions. Now, this makes a lot of things very complicated. First, um, many of us don't want to be um, involved in every single decision that the co-op is making. So we need to th think of ways to either to delegate this decision making to uh, some um, to others or to the co-op itself, or to give uh, like uh, a brief indications of our priorities, our main priorities, and then decisions will be made by that. And these are many 
many uh, possibilities to explore. But my personal belief is that, yes, that Derekov should and probably can give us more ways to make decisions with respect to the use of our data. Right. Um, we are almost at the end of the session. Um, just to give our audience a sense of how they can get involved and what they could maybe do themselves, do you have any tips and suggestions? So we left our emails at the last for the last slide. I don't know if this is being recorded okay. or not and put online, but um, but you can also Google us. This is easy. We'd be happy to communicate with whoever is in, interested. So far, we've been running some workshops uh, around this topic, and uh, we would be happy to see who is interested in joining us in the future workshops. There will be a web page for the project. I don't know, cannot promise exactly when that would happen, but I would expect that to happen in the next few months. Any other thing that I forgot, Katrina? And then also just to remind you of our sort of request for pointers to related projects, um, suggestions and opportunities for synergies are very, very welcome. Um, and in terms of picking up um, particular questions in this space, um, also, when there's a web page, it will be easier to find some of our writing on this topic where some of what we do is we highlight some of what we think are the interesting open research questions in various disciplines and domains. Great. I feel like people should know how to find you now. Um, and we already had someone reach out uh, with their Telegram handle, so I'll pass that on to you as well. Thank you so much. Uh, I certainly learned a lot. I hope our audience has as well. Thank you. And uh, thank you everyone for coming and joining us here. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.